Okay, as Jim says, I, I'm going to be talking about proteins secreted from pathogens called effectors. You've already heard something about them in the talks this morning. And I'm going to be looking a little bit about how they are acting to suppress, manipulate um, host defenses, the immune system in the plant, but also, um, or conversely, how they can actually be recognized by that system. So the pathogen I'm talking about is Phytophthora infestans. It's an oomycete, not a fungus, although, as I show you later on, it'll, it behaves a lot like a fungus. Uh, it remains the most uh, serious disease of potatoes, a real threat to um, uh, potato production globally. The reason that we have potatoes uh, here in Europe is that we uh, spray crops uh, very intensively. On a bad season, it can be weekly sprays, so up to 20 sprays throughout the growing season. There's been a lot of attempts over the years to uh, breed potato, to introduce um, resistance genes from different wild potato species. These have had very, very limited success indeed, uh, although one or two recent ones seem to be holding up reasonably well. So what we're trying to do is to understand more about how Phytophthora infestans works, how it's able to infect the plant and cause this, and a little bit more about uh, how it doesn't work, how the, how the, the plant can fight back. So at, uh, at the risk of, uh, of repeating stuff you've already heard this morning, I will go over a little bit of the, the basic dogma about uh, the molecular interactions between plants and pathogens, but using the, the, the pathogen life cycle. So Phytophthora is airborne. It's blown around as spores in the wind where it rains. These are washed down onto the leaf surface. They release these swimming zoospores, which insist and germinate to form an apressorium. This can penetrate an epidermal cell uh, and form the first of two uh, biotrophic structures, the infection vesicle. As it spreads through the leaf as hypha over the first uh, three days of colonization of the plant, we get these finger-like protrusions, Horstoria, just home in on one here. These are the sites at which um, arguably there's, there's uptake of nutrients from the plant, but also the sites at which effector proteins can be secreted to either act in the apoplast or to be delivered inside a living plant cell to manipulate host defenses. The dogma says again that uh, in many cases these effectors will uh, directly target defense associated proteins in the plant and will manipulate their function in some way to uh, subvert the immune system. At this point the pathogen's winning, it's able to colonize the plant. But if any of those effector proteins are re recognized by a resistance protein in the plant, um, then they get called avirulence proteins. That, that cell can commit suicide a localized program cell death called the hypersensitive response, and the pathogen is uh, prevented from spreading further. So there are a couple of uh, questions that we're uh, working on. One is, what are the effector targets? What are, what are they actually doing when they get inside the plant cell, and how are they suppressing defenses? And the other side of the coin is, is, is how are the resistance proteins detecting these effectors? Do the effector targets actually play a part in that? Okay, so introduce you to uh, an effector from Phytophthora infestans. This is AVR3A. It's recognized by the potato resistance R3A. It has a very simple structure. It's a small protein, 147 amino acids long. It has an N-terminal signal peptide for secretion from the pathogen. The C-terminal half of the protein is the business end, the effector domain. And in between these is a domain containing these conserved motifs, RXLR and EER. These are present in a wide range of secreted proteins from different uh, plant pathogenic oomycetes. Uh, they've been shown to, to, to be required for these proteins to get inside living cells. Within the infestans genome, we have a very large number of genes potentially encoding these effectors. And so far, all of the avirulence proteins which have been identified from Phytophthora infestans are members of this uh, class of effector protein. So the, the plant's telling us uh, that these are important. Okay, that large number needed to be whittled down for us. We've spent a lot of time trying to, uh, to really home in on, on, a, on a set of effectors that we, we want to characterize in more detail. We've looked at their transcriptional upregulation during infection. Uh, that's shown in red here. Many of them are upregulated in the first uh, two days of infection. Some of them are earlier than that. Down here we have um, uh, uh, a Venn diagram of the RxLRs that are expressed in different genotypes of Phytophthora infestans. What you find is that there can be differences in the genes which are detectably expressed using microarrays as you look from one genotype to another. 
But there is a core set of genes which are expressed in all cases. This is work that's ongoing um, with uh, Kabindrik and Lell, who's got a, um, a, a poster here, which maybe people have a bit of time left to, to have a look at. Another um, factor that's helped us to, to select some of these uh, effectors is whether they're critical to infection. We've used transient RNAi and stable transformation to silence um, uh, RXLRs. Um, we can see a, a significant reduction in virulence of Phytophthora infestans when we've silenced 20 of these genes. Another factor that we take into consideration is, is comparison with uh, Phytophthora capsici. Edgar Houtema, who's here in Dundee, has now got a, a capsici lab. Uh, capsici shares um, 39 out of our 60 effectors that we've selected. Uh, they, they have a potential common ancestry. And the importance there is that CAPCC shares two common hosts with inf infestans. It's able to infect tomato, they both are, and Nicotia benthamiana, a plant I'll, I'll refer to a lot. Um, CAPCC can't infect potato, uh, and infestans can't infect pe pepper, but CAPCC can. So, so it, it offers an opportunity for, to, for us to start to look at the molecular basis of non-host resistance or host range. So the first question, is what are these RXLR effectors doing inside plant cells? Uh, to address that, because we think that many of the targets of these effectors are going to be proteins, we've used a, a yeast to hybrid screen. The library that uh, we've made is a, is, a, is a mixture of RNA samples from different time points during potato Phytophthora infestans interaction. This has been screened with our RXLR effectors. 23 of them, although they were very deep screens, gave us no interactors at all. Maybe that these are not targeting proteins or the proteins are um, uh, inaccessible or, 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 or whatever. 32 of the effectors, however, gave us um, a, a dominant interactor from these screens. So these are, are things that we can follow up in more detail. And five of them were high, highly promiscuous. They in, interacted apparently with a wide range of different host proteins. So we have uh, at the end of this screen more than 100 uh, plant proteins that are potential targets of, of effectors. Our effectors fused to um, GFP or RFP have been expressed inside plant cells to see where they go, see if there are any differences there. We see that nearly half of them are generally cytoplasmic. Um, they're not degraded. We've looked on westerns, they're, they're stable. Some of them are membrane associated. In, in, in the majority of these cases, they're associated with the plasma membrane. Um, around about a quarter of them are, are, are localized in the nucleus, and one or two are uh, involved with, the, uh, or associating with the cytoskeleton, in this case, um, uh, microtubules. So they're, they're going to different locations within the plant cell. One of the cytoplasmic effectors is AVR3A, and we've looked at that in a bit more detail. I'm not going to go into details now in this talk, but AVR3A um, interacts with a ubiquitin E3 ligase in the plant called CMPG1 and prevents its normal function. Uh, CMPG1 is required for cell death um, in perception uh, in, in response to perception of a range of different elicitors from different pathogens, AVR3A is able to suppress the cell death in all cases. So that's all I want to talk about with AVR3A. And I'm just going to get, give you one story ab about an effector and its target, one of the membrane-associated effectors. And this one's uh, PIO3192, really catchy name. That's its uh, location within the genome. And in yeast 2 hybrid, um, O3192 interacted with two um, potato proteins. These were related. Um, you can see the interaction at the top here. Uh, another RXLR AVR2 doesn't interact with either of these proteins. These proteins have uh, an N-terminal uh, NAC DNA binding domain. They're NAC transcription factors, which are a plant-specific class of transcription factors. We've called them uh, NTP1 for NAC targeted by Phytophthora 1 and NTP2. They also have uh, a potentially a C-terminal transmembrane domain, which would anchor them in a membrane uh, in the plant cell. They're believed to be uh, an early warning system, if you like. They can be released from these membranes to go into the nucleus on perception of a, of a certain stimulus uh, and then trigger um, activation or repression of gene expression. So our RXLR, when we express it inside plant cells, it's, it localizes with a network, which is the endoplasmic reticulum. It co-localizes with an ER marker. Um, both NTP1 and NTP2 also localize to the ER network, which uh, goes around the outside of the nucleus. It's contiguous with the nuclear envelope. 
When we removed the transmembrane domains of these NAC transcription factors, we were interested to see whether they went into the nucleus or not. Initially, we couldn't detect them at all in Westerns or uh, under the microscope until we added uh, the proteasome inhibitor MG132. So like many transcription factors, these guys are uh, turned over by the proteasome in the nucleus. So when we add the proteasome inhibitor, we see them accumulate then in the nucleus, as you can see in these, these, uh, these close-ups. So these transcription factors are potentially released from the endoplasmic reticulum. On, the, on a particular stimulus, they go into the nucleus, they do their business, and then they're turned over by the, uh, the proteasome. When we look at the uh, potential interaction between 03192 and um, uh, our two NTPs in planter using split YFP, we see that 03192 interacts with both NTP1 and NTP2 potentially. Um, we get res restoration of fluorescence um, at the, uh, uh, the ER uh, membranes. We don't see any fluorescence when we use AVR2 as a control. The next thing we wanted to, to look at was the expression of our effector and the two targets. So 03192 is upregulated quite early on in infection, around about 16 hours. This is a time point at which, under the microscope, we start to see the formation of Horstoria, the, 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 the means by which these effectors are delivered inside the plant cell. In contrast, both NTP1 and NTP2 are down-regulated during infection. However, if we grow Phytophthora in a liquid medium and we remove the Phytophthora, just take the culture filtrate from that medium and infiltrate that into the plant as a sort of cocktail of PAMPs from Phytophthora, what we find is that both NTP1 and NTP2 are coordinately upregulated by this treatment. We take just the media that's used to grow the Phytophthora infestans, this has no effect on the gene expression of these NACs. So both of them are upregulated by PAMPs but they're not upregulated during infection. So the active pathogen has done something there to suppress the, the induction of these genes. So they're clearly important to plant defense, potentially. So the next thing to do is, is to investigate whether they really are important to defense or not. To do that, we've, um, we've silenced them using virus-induced gene silencing. We've developed two different silencing constructs for each of them, for NAC1 and for NAC2, or NTP1 and NTP2. In each case, after uh, 10 days after inoculating Phytophthora, we see a much stronger uh, uh, colonization and sporulation of the pathogen uh, on the silenced plants compared to unsilenced leaves. And we, we're able to quantify that by um, washing the spores off the leaf surface and counting them. And we see near, nearly a doubling in the number of spores. If we look early on in infection, after just two to three days during the biotrophic colonization of the pathogen, we see a much more rapid colonization on, on silenced plants compared to the unsilenced plant. So it would appear that they um, are either uh, both involved in the, if, if functionally re uh, non-redundantly in, in different defense responses to the pathogen, or they act potentially together. Remember, they are coordinately upregulated. And we have a, a Phytophthora infestans line that we've um, transformed to stably silence the expression of 03192. It's uh, significantly down-regulated for 03192, but we've not disturbed the expression of other effectors, such as AVR3A, AVRBLB2, and uh, IPI01, or AVRBLB1. All of these guys have, have got a, a published um, record as suppressors of plant immunity. What we see with our silence line is it's reduced in its ability to, to colonize both potato and Nicotiana benthamiana, two of the hosts of Phytophthora infestans. However, when we take this silence line and put it onto our uh, Vigs plants, where we've knocked down the expression of NTP1 and NTP2, we see a dramatic um, colonization with the silence line. So it appears that when you've, you've, you've silenced an effector that is essential for infection, if you remove its targets from the plant as well, then you can restore the ability of that pathogen to infect. Okay, so what is 03192 actually doing to these NAT transcription factors? I want you to home in on these middle panels here first. If we take uh, NTP1 and NTP2, express them inside the plant cell and treat with our culture filtrate, our PAMP cocktail from Phytophthora infestans, what we see is that uh, there's no accumulation of the, of, of the transcription factors in the nucleus. We're not going to see it because they're being turned over, presumably, by the proteasome. 
So when we, the, we add the proteasome inhibitor MG132, we then see the accumulation of these transcription factors in the nucleus when we treat with this culture filtrate. The treatment with the culture filtrate here results in a reduction in our ability to detect both NTP1 and NTP2. And then the ability to detect in this case is restored when we treat um, with, the, with the MG132. Over here is a control. We've treated these plants um, with just the media that's used to grow the phytophthora infestans rather than the culture filtrate. And we don't see any accumulation of the NACs um, in the nucleus upon, upon treatment with media and MG132. So what's the effector doing? Uh, if we look over the far side here, um, in this case we've co-expressed NTP1 or NTP2 with our effector. We've treated with culture filtrate. We don't see any difference here. But if we look down in our western, there's a restoration of the stability of, the, of, the, of both these transcription factors. So presumably they're not being turned over by the proteasome. And sure enough, when you treat with MG132 as well as culture filtrate, in the presence of the effector, we don't see the nuclear accumulation of these transcription factors. So our conclusion is that the, the uh, effector in this case is acting to prevent either the release of these uh, transcription factors from the ER or the preventing them enter the entering the nucleus. <coughs> okay, so I want to, to shift now to recognition of effectors um, and the recognition of AVR2 by R2, the, um, potato resistance protein R2, and whether the effector target of AVR2 plays any role in that. Now, this is AVR2 at the top. Um, it's, uh, when it's co-expressed in the plant with R2, we get this strong cell death response. You'll have seen images like this in Jonathan's talk earlier on. But if we look in um, um, isolates of Phytophthora infestans that are able to infect potato plants with have, which uh, uh, have R2, they have this form of AVR2, which we call AVR2-like. It has a, a 13 uh, amino acid differences. And if we look extensively in the pathogen population, we don't find any other forms other than AVR2 and AVR2-like out there. Both AVR2 and AVR2-like interact with uh, a host protein, BSL1, in yeast. This is a, a control over here, is another effector from Phytophthora infestans that closely related to AVR2. There's no interaction there. And this pattern can be reproduced inside the plant using split YFP. So we get evidence of the interaction between AVR2 and BSL1 and AVR2-like and BSL1, but no evidence with this other effector 08949. So what's BSL1? This is a, a phosphatase, and it's involved in the brassinosteroid signal transduction pathway. So this is interesting to us. There's, there's not much out there in the literature that implicates the brassinosteroid signaling or brassinosteroid signal transduction in... Uh, in biotic stress responses. So we're quite keen to know why AVR2 targets that, and that's work that's ongoing uh, by Dion Turnbull in the lab, a PhD student who's got a, a poster here on that, which I urge you to go and see. To start to address the question of what BSL1 might be doing for the plant as far as Phytophthora is uh, concerned, we've silenced it, again, using two different constructs, um, uh, virus-induced gene silencing constructs. So we've been able to silence BSL-1, but not other closely related BSLs, such as BSL-2. And one of the things that we've looked at within these plants is whether R2 is still able to recognize AVR2. So here we have a leaf from an unsilenced plant as controls. We've got the resistance protein Rx, co-expressed with the potato virus X coat protein, um, and we get the strong cell death phenotype. Down here, R3A, which it, um, recognizes AVR3A, co-expressed the two of them, you get cell death. Here we have R2 co-expressed with AVR2, and these other guys are all R2 orthologs that recognize AVR2. They're from different uh, wild species of potato. So when we silence BSL-1, we lose all of these R2 HRs. So clearly BSL-1 is in some way um, required for this uh, R2 recognition or HR response. Either it's mediating the recognition or it's involved in the signaling downstream from that. This is work that uh, has, uh, took place in our collaborators' lab, in Sophie and Camoon's lab at TSL. Uh, Diane Saunders did it. This, these pull-downs were with um, GFP. Um, she's co-IP'd um, over the far side. Um, R2, fused to GFP, has been pulled down when it's co-expressed with a MIC-tagged BSL-1. BSL-1 does not come down with the uh, R2. So that 
in the absence of, the, of any effector, there's no evidence that R2 interacts with BSL1 at all. On the far side, these two are co-expressed, but also expressed with AVR2-like, the form that evades recognition by R2. We know that AVR2-like interacts with BSL1, but clearly it doesn't promote any um, interaction between R2 and BSL1. That's obviously a different story in the middle, where we've co-expressed R2, BSL1, but with AVR2 in this case. AVR2 we know interacts with BSL1, but it must be doing something to the BSL1 that's allowing the R2 then to interact and pull down the BSL1. So the next step for us is to find out more about the molecular basis of this interaction and whether BSL1 is a guardie, is, is being guarded by R2. So in conclusion, I uh, hope I've convinced you that these RXLR effectors, amongst other things, are involved, uh, uh, potentially, are involved in suppressing host defenses. They target um, uh, various proteins in the plant. What I've talked about are some of the regulators, such as those involved in ubiquitination, phosphorylation or dephosphorylation, as in the case of BSL-1, uh, transcriptional regulators, such as the uh, NTPs, and 03192, is able to prevent the nuclear translocation of, of our two NACs, NTP1 and NTP2, into the uh, um, following uh, PAMP perception. Some of the effectors um, we're finding from the East 2 hybrid are, are not obviously targeting proteins which might be involved in immunity. Some of these are potentially involved in metabolic change in the plant. Obviously the pathogens there, its primary purpose is to get food from that plant, so there may be some role for effectors in manipulating metabolism. That's something for the future. The RXLRs are vulnerable to recognition by resistance proteins, and what I showed you is that R2 recognizes AVR2. Um, that's mediated by the, a target protein of AVR2, BSL1. So I'll just finish off by acknowledging uh, some of the key people in the lab who've been involved in the work I've talked about. Uh, Ellie and Susan, and now Dion, are working on the R2, AVR2 story. Hazel over here, um, along with Miles, but mainly Hazel, has done all of the work on the NAC transcription factors that interact with 03192. Thank you very much. So if I understand correctly, AVR2-like interacts with BSL1 but doesn't trigger R2-dependent HR, is that correct? Correct. So what do you think the purpose of that interaction is? Do you think it acts to prevent recognition of r 2 or is it dominant negative over AVR2? Well, clearly, in the, the interaction happens. It must be modifying BSL1 in some way. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think there's, there's, there's still quite a lot of work to work to, to, to really get to the basis of how R2 is recognizing AVR2, whether it's a complex of the two proteins or not. Um, but clearly, AVR2, like the changes have got below the radar. It's a more general question. Um, in some ways, it's surprising me. You have. You have um uh, these are my six, and they put the potential to put in, let's say, 40, 50, 60 effectors into a, into a host. How come when you silence one, do you see a phenotype? Well, to be fair, we didn't see um, interactions with these NACs of any of the other effectors that we looked at. So um, I, we are expecting functional redundancy to exist within the wider com uh, the complement of RXLRs when you look at that, that huge set of 500. I don't think they're all used um, as you go from one pathogen to another. Um, we're getting into, in, into the realms of why they're not all used, but, but, but one of the things is that they can be switched on and off um, in response to recognition. <laughs>